All right, Alexander, let's talk about the conflict in Ukraine and let's uh, let's focus on uh, Istanbul Plus. Uh, you, you coined that that term, Istanbul Plus. So <laughs> let's uh, let's remember that. Uh, a very very good way to describe the the possible the possible framework for um, negotiations to take place between Russia and Ukraine or Russia and the collective West. But before we get to Istanbul Plus, before we get to some of the statements coming out of the United Nations Security Council with regard with regards to Ukraine, if if Istanbul Plus is rejected, which most likely it will be, but we'll get to that. Let's actually start off the video talking about the op-ed in the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago from J.D. Vance. And J.D. Vance said it very clearly. The math simply does not add up. Ukraine cannot win because the numbers do not add up for a Ukraine victory. We're going to lose this conflict. That's what J.D. Vance said. The math is not in Ukraine's favor, not even close to being in Ukraine's favor. So uh, let's talk about that article from J.D. Vance, who is a senator from uh, Ohio. Yeah, and I thought I have to, I'm going to say it immediately, I thought it was one of the best uh, comments made by an American political figure about the conflict in Ukraine that I have seen. It's a relief, in fact, to find that there is some political figure in the United States who's able to add up and uh, look at the situation and face it squarely. Now, I will say this, the entire article, I mean, it does pull its punches towards the end. But he makes the point that we've been making and so many other people have been making, Alex Vashinin, Byron Baletic, um, you name it, lots of people, that ultimately those people who demand that the United States, that Europe go on fighting and supporting Ukraine until victory, whatever, the, however that is defined, are being completely delusional. The United States isn't making enough weapons. It's not producing enough ammunition. It's not producing enough Patriot missiles. It's you know not producing tanks or infantry fighting vehicles or whatever. Nowhere near enough to enable Ukraine to prevail over Russia. Nor is Europe, nor is that going to change in any future point in time. So that any money sent to support Ukraine is simply money thrown away. It's the uh, sunk costs fallacy taken to the extreme because that's all that that would be. It's not an investment. It's just throwing more money, good money after after bad. So, uh, you know, it, it's 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 a relief to see that J.D. Vance, at least, is coming up with these thoughts. And there are some rumors that J.D. Vance is one of the people that Trump is considering for vice president. I hope, by the way, that doesn't happen, because I think J.D. Vance is my personal selfishly. Uh, based on this article, seems to be one of the saner heads in the Senate, and I think he's strongly needed there. But anyway, there we go. I mean, it, it, it was an excellent article. It's already been criticised by a number of people. Uh, there's an article in National Review which says that J.D. Vance is calling for surrender, which, by the way, he absolutely doesn't. He still clings to this theory that Ukraine can defend itself by building fortifications and holding the Russians back like that. But he does want negotiations. Anyway, one way or the other, it does show that there are some people in the United States who are setting it out as it is. And I can't help but think that over time, comments like this, ideas like this, are going to gain increasing traction with more and more of the political class. And by the way, with parts of the military as well. Uh, the military must be becoming increasingly worried about the extent to which Ukraine is becoming a massive drain on American resources to no useful purpose. Yeah, and um, Ron Johnson gave an interview to uh, Glenn Greenwald, Senator Ron Johnson, I believe, was Wisconsin, if, 
if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that, but um, he gave an interview to Glenn Greenwald and he pretty much uh, echoed what J.D. Vance said. He he basically said that Ukraine wants to, Ukraine cannot win this conflict. And the Biden White House, they're just trying to, to find a way to drag this out, at least until the, the election. Um, more and more voices, hopefully more and more voices will start to come out and say that, that this this war can't be won. E- even if they they support Ukraine, even if they, you know, a year ago they were saying as long as it takes, today the situation is that the numbers are not in your favor and they will not change. And J.D. Vance spells that out. He says, even if we're to double our ammunition production, the United States and Europe, we still cannot match what the Russians are doing. So even Absolutely. under the best case scenario, the numbers do not add, do not add up. And uh, one final comment on on JD Vance pulling his punches. I, I believe all the the politicians that are now going to come out and and start to say that this war cannot be won. They're going to always have to add that that caveat towards the bottom of the article, which says, you know, I support Ukraine. Putin's a dictator. Russia's bad. Um, you know they can they, they, maybe they can hold out and we can get to some sort of stalemate before negotiations. They always have to put those caveats in there because you know at the end of the day they still are uh, politicians. So uh, what are, what are your thoughts there? Oh, uh, absolutely. Jeff? And can I just say those who criticise JD Vance and he's come in for you know quite a lot of criticism for that article. They don't argue with the facts as he's laying them out. That's what's so frustrating about this. Um, so he's he's laying out the facts people just don't want to face them they they talk emotional language about surrender and all of that but they don't want to you know look at the situation squarely and say to themselves well you know maybe maybe he's right maybe we can't produce enough shells maybe we can't produce enough air defense missiles maybe the russians are going to prevail irrespective of what we do they they don't want to face that and um, I agree. I think over time, this is going to gain traction. It's also going to gain traction with the American people outside the political class who are already very, very skeptical about this. And J.D. Vance does have an audience. He does have a reach. He can reach people because he's a senator, U.S. senator, that others like, you know, Alex Vashinin or, uh, uh, you know, God help us ourselves, probably can't do to anything like the same degree. So it, it is very good that he's talking like this. And I have to say, not for the first time, I say to myself, you know, an American senator is able to come out and write an article like this and get it published in the New York Times. And another American senator is able to come and talk about this to Glenn Greenwald. There is at least a debate in the United States. High time we had that same debate in Europe too. We are suffering far more from this war than the United States is. We've brought disaster upon ourselves, upon disaster, and we're still talking absurd ideas like Macron sending troops to Ukraine and Olaf Scholz saying that he won't pick up the phone and talk to Putin until all Russian troops withdraw from Ukraine, including Crimea, by the way. Um, and, you know, the British, all of them still talking in you know, the language of as long as it takes, as long as it takes is the worst stupidest slogan ever made. I mean, it was the classic blank check. If you want to, if you want to see what a disastrous thing it was, listen to Zelensky. He wants four million shells, a point that J.D. Vance said. Actually, he really wants seven million shells. He wants, uh, was it 150 <laughs> Patriot launchers. I mean, you know, tell him, tell him as long as it takes, you know, as much as it takes, he'll demand everything. He'll demand everything you've got and then he'll come back for more, which is exactly what he's doing. You never write blank checks for people. I mean, I cannot understand why that isn't understood. Any business that writes out blank checks <laughs> invariably goes bankrupt as a night follows day. Individuals who hand out blank checks do the same. J.D. Vance, at last, is pointing that out. 
Yeah. N- never write blank checks to to dumb actors. <laughs> that should be like uh, one of the golden rules in life. <laughs> anyway, uh, how, how about The Sun, by the way? How about The Sun coming out with an article talking about uh, the plan to conquer Crimea? I don't know if you saw that, but they yeah, have absolutely. maps and everything. Even yeah. to this day. Absolutely. They're still going on about about twenty storm shadow missiles, a swarm of drones. Then the Ukraine army starts storming the the peninsula. The Russian army retreats, and the war is won. I mean, it's it's yeah. It, it, I'm you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, but, it, it, but comment on comment on the UK's some of the yeah. UK publications and their I mean, it, and, it, and their it, crazy articles. Yeah. It, it, it is surreal, and we get. Uh, by the way, that it's not untypical of the British media, I should say. I mean, the British media has been absolutely bonkers throughout this war. I mean, they've been writing a cartoon war, <laughs> describing a cartoon war that has absolutely no basis in reality. They talk about twenty storm shadows. The Russians have shot down twenty storm shadows in a day. They have. I, I remember it. I remember when it happened. I talked about it. They are able to shoot down storm shadows. Ukraine is retreating. Its military units are surrendering. There have been more news about this recently. You know, that Zelensky is complaining about this. Sirsky is making threats about this. They're having to mobilize, you know, 20-year-olds and throw them into the battlefield without training. I mean, talking about them marching and taking Crimea is absurd. But, of course... The sun isn't about lighting realities. It's about, you know, increasing its circulation numbers, which, by the way, have plunged in recent years. It's no longer the force that it was. So that's what they're all about. But, of course, what they're doing at the same time is they're utterly misrepresenting mis, uh, and misinforming the UK public and doing so in a disastrous way. Exactly. It's very sinister what they're doing. I mean, it's cartoonish. It's cartoonish to, to the max, but it's also very sinister what uh, what they're doing. Anyway, this is a good uh, segue into uh, reality and and real proposals, and that that takes us to uh, Istanbul Plus. What is Istanbul Plus? Yeah, this is a very interesting thing, and it came out from a meeting that Putin had with Lukashenko um, a couple of days ago, and uh, we had the introductory comments. They were all shown on television, on Russian television, and the Kremlin provided a readout. And then directly after Putin spoke, we got further clarification about what he meant from his uh, spokesman, his press spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. So Putin uh, was talking about how um, there'd been this negotiation between Russia and Ukraine back in 2022, that it was not true that Russia was against negotiations. It's always been in favor of negotiations. He made that very clear. Um, And he said that, you know, they'd reached that agreement in 2022 in Istanbul, and then the Western powers sabotaged it. Now the Western powers are in trouble. Um, The Russians, however, are not going to punish them. By refusing to talk, they're still prepared to talk, but any new negotiation basically has to accept the existing realities. In other words, we can't just return to Istanbul. And Putin then floated the possibility, this he did, you know, we seem present there, because of course Belarus still has an embassy in Kiev. So there's still contacts between the Belarus government and the Ukrainian government. He floated the possibility that just as Belarus played or tried to play a mediating role back in February, March 2022, that they might do that again. And that the Russians, when they get into a certain position, and he actually said that, you know, when the moment comes, Putin turned to Lukashenko, he said, I might contact you in order that we can put our proposals, whatever they are, forward. And um, Peskov then provided clarity. He provided further clarity as to what those proposals might be. And they will be based, to some extent, on the Istanbul agreements. Now, it's important here to reiterate what those Istanbul agreements were. 
the first is that NATO, Ukraine doesn't join NATO. I mean, that is absolutely uh, ruled out. So Ukraine will not join NATO. That's one. Secondly, there will be strong protections for Russians, Russian speakers in Ukraine. That is two. Thirdly, there will be the elimination of people with, you know, the neo-Nazi ideology. We know now, contrary to claims that the Ukrainians made, that they did enter into those commitments in the draft Istanbul Agreement. So that is already there. So that's, however, only the starting point, because Peskov, like Putin, said that any new agreement must, however, accept the existing realities. The existing realities must take into account the territorial changes. So that means, at a minimum, Zaporozhye, Kherson, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, Crimea being recognized now as part of Russia. So we're going far beyond the Istanbul Plus arrangement, the, the original Istanbul arrangement, which only covered Donbass and Crimea. Um, I've no doubt at all that it will include also the buffer zone in Kharkiv region that the Russians have been talking about. And my own personal view, based again on what Putin is saying and has said many times and on what Peskov has been saying, is that there will be Russian troops, at least, at the very least, stationed in other places in Ukraine. Odessa, Kiev, probably some other places too, to protect Russians and to defend Russian interests. Now, all of that was said on the very same day that the Russian ambassador to the UN, to the UN, Vasily Nebenzia, an incredibly tough and formidable figure, by the way, um, and somebody who's clearly in very high standing in Moscow and who clearly was speaking with authority from the Kremlin. He said, in effect, that the only subject that people are going to be discussing before long is the unconditional surrender of Ukraine. And I read that to mean two things. Firstly, that if Istanbul Plus is not accepted by Ukraine, then the Russians will press on and dictate terms. But I also, and thinking about this further, I also think it means no negotiations with Zelensky himself, that Zelensky, as part of any deal, will have to step down. Yeah. What are the um, chances for uh, the collective West, the United States, because that's, that's the country that matters, to, to actually uh, follow up on this proposal from Russia. If, if you want to call it a proposal, this, this yeah. idea, this hint at a, at a negotiation from Russia. Yeah. Because, if I, uh, just, just to make it clear, this is not an official, like the Russians haven't officially said, this is, this is what we would like to, to talk about, but they're throwing it out there. What are the chances? If, if Biden is president, none at all. That I, it's, I mean, I think that's the first thing to say. I mean, there is no conceivable way that Joe Biden is going to agree to anything like this. He has recently, uh, or, or officials um, have recently, Biden administration officials have recently said that it'll be for Ukraine to decide for itself what the goes to mean and what concessions it makes. But of course, we saw that when Ukraine did make concessions over the Istanbul process, the United States blocked them. I cannot imagine Biden accepting anything like this. I cannot imagine the neocons who populate the Biden administration accepting anything like this. I can't imagine the Europeans agreeing to this either. So I think that's the first thing to say. So if Biden is elected in November, it, you know, this is absolutely out. It's not going to happen. Um, if Donald Trump is elected in November, then maybe we might, you know, look at this again. I, if, if Trump were to want to come to some kind of real deal with the Russians, um, Putin is laying out what the Russian terms are. And going back to what J.D. Vance was saying, the article by J.D. Vance in the New York Times, it's important to stress Istanbul Plus, if it's implemented, 
does not does not undermine U.S. core interests. On the contrary, in a kind of a way, it preserves them because it means that there would be a negotiated resolution to the conflict in Ukraine, which would not affect the existing uh, uh, the existence of NATO as it stands now. So, you know, at that point, you know, if Trump were elected, if he wanted a deal, he's got, I won't say a deal there on the table, but possibly of the makings of one. Whether, of course, he'd go for it is another matter. The problem with, with that, Alexander, is that t- today it's April. Trump becoming president would be, well, November's the election, but you're looking at January 2025. A lot, a lot is going to change until then, and, and most likely it's going to get much worse it's going for, to get far, uh, for far Ukraine. Worse. And for, and, and for Ukraine and for the collective West. So, so you're probably looking at a much uh, harsher uh, deal being presented by then if Trump wins to the collective West. This is absolutely correct. I, I mean, I think that there's increasing talk that the Ukrainians might be forced back to the East, the West Bank of the Dnieper before the end of the year. That would mean, in effect, the loss of 40 percent of Ukraine. Well, that to happen, I don't see the Russians giving that up. I'm just saying. And I still think they would want something to sort out with Odessa as well. But anyway, I mean, Putin has given the first hint of where or what he is thinking. But the threat, unconditional surrender is still there. And, you know, I think that is looming on the horizon. I think that the military situation in Ukraine, as we've discussed in many programs, is deteriorating fast. Indeed, over the last few hours, there's been more reports of further deteriorations, as I said in the program. Zelensky is now admitting that whole new military units are surrendering and troops are being encircled, Ukrainian troops are being encircled and all of that. So, you know, more likely than not, if by November... The existing Istanbul Plus is not accepted. By January, when Trump is president, the terms will be much harsher. And beyond that, I mean, frankly, I I wonder whether the Russians would even be interested in a negotiation at all. Yeah. You know, watching all of these statements, you know, come from from Putin, you you watch his meeting with Lukashenko. I, I just think there's Lukashenko next to Putin. At one time, five, six, ten years ago, I don't know, Lukashenko and Russia were, you know, hit or miss. And Lukashenko was was also playing the the the, the European, the EU angle. He was playing the Russian angle. Now there's Lukashenko uh, sitting next to Putin. You know, Belarus, Lukashenko, Russia's number one ally, its number one friend, 100% with Russia. Wouldn't wouldn't it be ideal for for the Putin administration to to have a government in Kiev along the lines of of Lukashenko? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be an ideal, an optimal out, outcome to absolutely, all of this? absolutely? That's why they're talking about <laughs> Istanbul Plus. Because to be absolutely clear, if Istanbul Plus were ever implemented, that would be that would be the result. I mean, we would have a pro-Russian government in Kiev, very much like the one we're seeing in Belarus, probably even more so, actually, because uh, Lukashenko, uh, pre, you know, retains some uh, leeway and some level of independence. Um, a new government in, in, in Kiev uh, installed after a clear cut and disastrous military defeat would be far, far uh, weaker relative to Russia than Lukashenko is, who's been there a long time. But, you know, um, I think that may be one reason why the Russians are not going to get that, because I think the West will not agree to this. I mean, if the optimal outcome for the Russians is a pro-Russian government in Kiev, the West has been working over time ever since 1991 to stop that happening. And I think that they would still be insistent on not not letting that happen. 
I, I, I've said this before, and I'm going to say this again. I think that the predominant view, at least in Europe, and with some hardliners in the United States, is that they were would rather Ukraine went down to total defeat in circumstances where they can go on pretending that it's you know the weakness of Biden, <laughs> the uh, uh, refusal of the Republicans to authorize funding, um, th- you know the, Trump. The, the, the the Trump, <laughs> uh, uh, the yeah. failure of Olaf Scholz to provide you know. 10,000 Patriot missiles. China. China, China, all of that. China support. So China support, you know, all of that. They would rather have that happen than um, agree to any sort of compromise over Ukraine, which would in effect uh, amount to an acceptance that the overarching neocon project has failed and that there are limits to American power. Completely agree. All right, uh, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Look for limited edition merchandise. The link is in the description box down below. Take care.